Hi, everybody. Dr. Drew Stevens here. Um, it is the 19th of July and just bringing you a couple of pieces of information relate, related to the 56, uh, 50 class and strategy. <clears throat> couple of things. Um, let's do it this way. Let's go through some logistics. Many of you uh, are continually coming back to me and asking me about the quizzes. Um, I am, to say the least, a little befuddled and shell-shocked because I have gone in and I've actually altered many of the quizzes. And for some reason, somehow, some way, those quizzes wound up reverting back to what they were before. Um, look, I'm not gonna waste a lot of your time going back and forth with quizzes that are functioning and not functioning. Not to mention the fact that some of those quizzes, just in my personal opinion, are not really giving you a lot on strategic implementation, but more on the simulation. So what I'm going to do is I'll alter whatever quizzes I can at this particular point, but at <clears throat> this juncture, I may just wind up giving away those points and you'll just get the point uh, total in there. And hopefully the videos and some of the other assignments as well as the capstone assignment will assist you with that. Um, secondly, there have been a number of questions related to the fact of rounds on capstone. Um, somehow, some way in some of the lectures, for whatever reason being, there were apparently two rounds being implemented within Capsum. There is no way, especially with a class this size, and more importantly, the fact that you're all doing this online, to implement multiple rounds in one week for Capsum. As I mentioned in another video, there's only going to be one week. I'm sorry, one round per week, and that is already embedded in the schedule. Somebody recently asked me, what is that schedule? That schedule is there, and it's pretty clear for you to see, but just again, <clears throat> the competition rounds in the 3rd, the 10th, the 24th, and the 31st of July. Four competition rounds. We're in the middle of round three, coming around home plate and going into the fourth round. So <clears throat> my suggestion for you is to please look at Capsum because there are no more than one round in each of the weeks, each of those weeks, again, ending on the 3rd, the 10th, the 24th, and the 31st. As far as the quizzes, <clears throat> again, I will amend those. And last but not least, excuse me, I had gotten injured. And so I am working with just one hand. I had to go in for surgery. So getting back to you has been slightly delayed and I hope you accept my apologies <clears throat> on the tardiness of that. As far as Capsum is concerned, <clears throat> really the three points that I wanna go over, here are the results for the second week <clears throat> for where we are because we're in the middle. You could probably see from my screen, the 19th, you're going into the third week of Capsum. There are <clears throat> still a number of issues that you really need to take into consideration that I'm still seeing here. The contribution margins are fairly low. Again, your contribution margins should be at least 30, 31% or higher, and they're not. So part of the problem is, is that you're not watching the SGNA, which is exceedingly important on the quantitative side. Look, I'm not looking for you, any of you to get frustrated with this exercise. I'm merely asking and suggesting for you to get comfortable with the information within the simulation because quantitative information is going to be just as important as qualitative information. And the more you can get adjusted to the financial controls and the financial commitments of the organization, the better off you're going to feel. Number two <clears throat> is that you really do all need to look at your balance sheets, let me go back to that, excuse me, your balance sheets where you are, because you're really wanting to take a look at three things. Number one, automation, where you're taking emergency loans at. Number two, account receivable. The reason being is because that account receivable is part of the liabilities that are owned to you. And if you're waiting too long to get your money back, you're going to wind up seeing probably less than 50 cents on the dollar in order to obtain that. And number three, your account payable and even your inventory for that matter. Again, inventory, just as much as anything else, is a liability. It's a liability because it's sitting on a shelf. It's a liability because people need to pay for it. But just as much, it's also an asset because it's something that could be liquidated fairly quickly. 
And last but not least, then you do really need to make certain that you're looking at these target market ratios. There are many times, at least in the last couple of weeks, especially when we went for the um, other rounds, where when you're looking at your target markets, many of you are off on that and you're being held with a lot of remaining inventory and that inventory is staying there because you're not looking to deplete it. You wanna to try to deplete that inventory as much as possible, <clears throat> okay? Now, with that in mind, I do want to go over one last thing with you and that's just a key learning point for this particular week. And let me make sure that you're able to see my screen <clears throat> so that I can do this for you. And that is related to just two things that I want to focus on with you just very, very quickly. And they include really leadership and succession planning. What I want to just go and review with you very quickly as far as strategy is concerned is that when we're looking at strategic implementation and when we're looking at this whole theory of strategy, there are really two things that are going to be very, very helpful for you in ensuring the fact that you have a good strategic model in which to run your team. Number one, you have to have the right people and the right people have, have to have the innate skill. In other words, they need to have the proper talent and the skills to do the job as if their life depended upon it. What I find is that many individuals that get involved in leadership, especially on the strategic level, are exceedingly tactical. And they're tactical because they're not really watching out for many of the nuances that make an organization great. What you need to ensure is, is that these individuals are humble, that these individuals understand the framework of what strategy is all about, and number three, that they surround themselves with good people. The fact is, is that when we talk about leadership, especially in the strategic umbrella, we know three very simple things. Number one, people are going to cover up their screw-ups constantly. They're never going to tell you that they made a mistake because people don't like being held accountable from time to time. And that's what gets many of the excuses that you see in organization. And because of those excuses, it's what makes organizations very tactical. Number two, sometimes it just sucks being at the top. And it sucks being at the top because you're the only one that then gets to make those decisions, which means that the buck stops with you. You can't look to somebody else and say, hey, help me with this. You can't look to somebody else and say, you need to make that decision. It's happened before, but in times of strife, in times of urgency, in times of chaos, and we see many organizations going into some chaos now, especially economically, you're looking for somebody that knows how to take over and how to move the organization forward. What you wanna be able to do is you wanna look at your team and you wanna be able to look for the people with those skills to help move that organization forward. I'm often reminded of two really cool movies. One was The Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith, and the other one was Working Girl with Mel Melanie Griffith. In the latter, Melanie Griffith was an office assistant. She was working on Wall Street in mergers and acquisitions. She had some idea for M&A activity, and her boss just went, blew her off. And from that perspective, there was no respect. There was no trust between either of the two of them. In the other, with Will Smith and the pursuit of happiness, it was about the gentleman that you see on the screen, Chris Gardner, who all he wanted to do was take his family out of homelessness, really protect his child. The fact is, is that he was working for Dean Witter Reynolds at the time. You had stockbrokers that were making six and seven figure incomes. They just treated Chris as just some other individual and he was not going to make it. That's not going to run your strategy really well. If you want to have and exert the best power and the best influence in people, you got to get to understand what people's interests are. You got to understand what their goals are, what motivates them. Because if you have the vision <clears throat> and the right vision, they're going to want to go and jump through hoops with you. But if you create this fraction, fractiousness between your team using a very loosely held term 
and yourself in a leadership role, then you're never going to move that organization forward. And that's what's going to help you. So from a strategic perspective, in a leadership perspective, you've got to do a couple of things. Number one, <clears throat> you've got to create an early win. You've got to create a win-win so that people can trust you, people can respect you, and they can see how your changes are really helping to create positive change within the organization. Now, that go, coincides with having to do mentoring, that coincides with having to do coaching, that coincides with a little bit of counseling. But the only way to move things forward is by creating an early win. But <clears throat> don't be a leader and sit on the sidelines and just direct everybody like the, the guy that's the orchestra leader and he has the baton. You know, when I see that, I see a guy no, doing nothing more than waving a little stick. You know what? At the end of the day, it's the people that are creating the music. It's the violinists, it's the uh, bassists, it's the percussionists and so on that are truly making a difference. That guy is just leading. And what it always astounds me, especially from a strategic level, are leaders that actually get involved, leaders that get their hands dirty, leaders that have been there and done that, because that really truly is then a better sign of respect. It's how organizations function, because people will really trust the leader that gets their hands dirty and gets in there with them. Don't tell me how to be a quarterback and how to throw the ball and ways to be the, you should have been a quarterback. You should have known what was going on. You should have read the defense, so on and so forth. <clears throat> in addition to that, good leadership is all about transparency. I can't stand when people are castigated for making mistakes. You know what? Mistakes are nothing more than education. Edison, fail. Ford, fail. Musk, fail. Um, uh, Zuckerberg, fail. Gates, fail. Jobs, fail. List goes on. You could look at thousands of experiments that they've had where they have failed time after time. The best strategic leaders use it. Failure is an education and they share it. They'll look around and they'll say, we screwed up. How do we fix this? What are the ways to fix this? And how do we work together? How do we stay committed to making this work in the best instance of the organization? And last but not least, before I get on to the one latter thing that I want to share with you on leadership <clears throat> is just some successful traits first. And that is good leaders are those that are very good communicators. They know how to talk to individuals. They share their goals. They share their visions, they share their value systems. And most importantly, they allow people to make suggestions on the team. It's never my way or the highway, but is it, 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 it is a collective. I don't use the word teamwork because I learned long ago, there really is no such thing as team. Look, at the end of the day, it, it, everybody is all about number one. But if you have a set of individuals that are working together, <clears throat> understand the vision, understand the value, understand how collaboratively they could reach an organizational goal, then things become better. But at the end of the day, teams are nothing more than a task force. And I say that because if you take Bob and Steve and they don't get along <clears throat> and you get one of these ridiculous leadership training classes at $200,000, and everybody's going to go whitewater rafting and you put Jim and Steve in, in a uh, boat together with a keg of beer, trust me, one of them ain't coming back. But if you have an instance where you have individuals that are openly sharing, understand each other from a behavior and a personality perspective and can help together move the ball forward, that's how things done. And the latter thing that I want to share with you on leadership is simply this, succession planning. Not enough strategic organizational leaders do proper succession planning. Succession planning is a modality in which you're building strength in the organization so that the organization during shifting wins, shifting competition, shifting globalization will actually create sustainable leadership, not only now, but for the future will also create business continuity. Part of the problem 
with too many organizations out there today is that there is a lack of business continuity out there. And so some of the nuances in building a good strategic organization is creating a great succession plan. Looking at the managers <clears throat> that can come up and keep that organization running the way it's been running. So one might look at Tim Cook at Apple and Steve Jobs picked a fairly decent operational guy. Tim may not be the visionary that Steve was, but <clears throat> Apple has done pretty darn well since he's been gone. The other exemplar to that would be General Electric when Jack Welsh retired and brought in Jim in ML. Now, Jim has been gone for quite some time. GE is no longer the force that it had been roughly 10, 15 years ago, but that is the notion of succession planning. And for all I know, <clears throat> I haven't done the follow-up work quite honestly, but ML lost on that succession planning simply because it's gone on for that bumpy ride. If you want to build a sustainable, comprehensive and competitive organization, then it comes down to two basic facts. Number one, creating a good succession plan to create leadership and business continuity, not only now, but in the future, but also building a core of leaders that can carry your organization into the next century, whenever, when, wherever, and however you need that to happen. This is Dr. Drew, I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening. I hope even with some of the hurdles, you're enjoying the course.